All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. This is, as you know, a webinar designed to officially launch the two global studies, Global Cocoa Market Study and Dominican, Reply, Dominican Republic Supply Case Study that were conducted by Gaia Cacao. These are studies funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, coordinated by the International Executive Service Organization, and advised by our team at the Fine Cacao and Chocolate Institute. I am Carla Martin, and I will be the moderator of this session. We have a jam-packed 60 minutes for all of you. We will stick very strictly to our schedule, and we invite you throughout to use down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, if you follow my pointer finger, the Q&A button. This stands for questions and answers in order to ask questions. We invite you to ask rigorous questions questions that have to do with the study itself. You will also see in our chat a variety of different links that we're providing to support you in finding what you need for today. Our presentations will take place in English. These studies are a free and open access and available for download at the links in the chat. They are also in English. And this entire live stream webinar is also being streamed via Facebook but by Cacao Movil, our partners for this webinar. We're very excited to have you here with us all. And I would like to now turn it over to my colleague, Anya Marolinska from the US Department of Agriculture, Foreign Agricultural Service to briefly introduce USDA and their role in these studies. Anya, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us today to hear the long-awaited launch of this ambitious effort. My name is Anya Madalinska, and I represent the Food for Progress International Food Assistance Program at USDA. Food for Progress is a program started originally by the Farm Bill um, by Congress in 1985, and in its almost three decades of operations, the program has made various investments in improving agricultural value chains throughout the world. Our imprint in cacao has been significant. Over the past decade, we've funded more than $180 million in programming, which contains work in cacao um, in countries all across the world from, um, from Ecuador to Ghana. Um, reflecting on our portfolio of work, we found an untapped opportunity to bridge the gap between um, farmer investment decisions in producing countries and what is happening in international global markets and the future projections. What happens on a farm in Ecuador or Ghana will be impacted by what happens in global markets. Therefore, in order to harness this opportunity and to mitigate risks, farmers should have access to this information. We believe that this information should be accessible to cacao actors who depend on it. Therefore, um, it is for this reason that IESC took on this challenge. They coordinated a participatory effort um, that was inclusive to engage, engage researcher, researchers and to produce information that would be free of cost and available to everybody from um, including all of our Food for Progress cacao beneficiaries, but also anyone who around the world who could benefit. 
so um, I want to extend a thank you to everybody who took part, um, and I'm looking for, very much forward to hearing um, the presentation. Thank you so much, Anya, and we're appreciative of your introduction. As I hope is becoming clear, this has been a collaborative effort that has involved dozens of people. To give you some context, we began this study uh, or the process of leading into this study last year before a COVID-19 vaccine had been released. During the time in which the study has been completed, the vaccine has been released. The Delta variant has developed, the Omicron variant has developed, booster shots have been released. We have team members who have been impacted by this pandemic who are currently facing the disease itself. This has been a study conducted in very different conditions than many that might have been conducted in the past. And we've been very fortunate to have partnered with the International Executive Service Corps, IESC, who has kindly and graciously coordinated and stewarded this study to its completion. I would like to invite Chad Ford, please, to introduce IESC and your work. Thank you, Carla. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. What a great turnout. I think we're above 100 participants uh, so far, and that's very exciting for us to, to, uh, for this event. We at IESC are very pleased to share these two USDA-funded reports, which provide comprehensive overviews of the cocoa chocolate markets and its many products, for example, the derivatives, value addition opportunities, and the respective price points in market opportunities. It is a snapshot in time, albeit a panoramic snapshot, um, given the depth and, and, and breadth of it. And we wanted to get that information out. We want it to be used. We hope these reports contribute to ongoing and future development projects seeking to empower stakeholders throughout the value chain with critical market data and insights to inform their business decisions, their collaboration among each other, and the policymakers that report back to uh, them uh, in, in, in these countries as they consider priorities in rural development. We hope those of, of you in here uh, that see the value to this information, share it as you see fit, bring parts of it into your trainings that you can use on your projects, use the Dominican Republic uh, country report as a template, uh, make it better, make it bigger, um, use it uh, as, as, as widely as you can. I would like to thank USDA for their engagement and feedback throughout this whole process. I would also like to thank uh, FCCI for leading this webinar uh, with your network and your outreach, Carla and Yome specifically for your critical and valuable inputs throughout this whole process. And of course the team from Gaia, which I cannot mention each one by name because it is too large uh, for your months of efforts on these studies. Finally, many of you in this webinar also served as guidance to the terms of reference. Some of you were key informants during this process, and some even served as peer review reviewers outside advisories during the development of this study. Thank you for that investment of your time, which greatly contributed to the findings and the analysis put into these studies. Back to you, Carla. Thank you so much, Chad. Again, what I hope you're hearing is how many different hands have been part of this project. This is a multi-continent, multi-stakeholder project that has involved dozens of different people working at different stages over time. Uh, there are too many people, in fact, for us to name and to express our gratitude to that have made this study possible. As I said, I'm Carla Martin. I'm the executive director of the Fine Cacao and Chocolate Institute with my colleague, Jaume Martirel Mir. Uh, I advised on this study. A number of our different team members also played a role in making sure that we were supporting a hybrid academic and industry approach to studying both the global market for cacao and chocolate and derivatives and the Dominican Republic case study supply chain. All of this took place over nearly a year. Gaia Cacao will share with you the six months in which they were involved in this study. Actually, if we really add it all up, it's more like nine months. It's basically like birthing a child. The amount of work that they have put into this has been enormous. And of course, it has taken place under difficult conditions in many ways. 
Our role at FCCI has been to provide rigorous academic advising support, as well as market expertise, to make sure that what comes out of this study is factual and rigorous in its approach. And what I'd like to briefly address before we jump into the meat of these studies themselves is what a market study is and what it is not. When it comes to what a market study is not, the first thing it is not is marketing. Marketing is something that is designed to sell products, to make consumers desire those products and more. This study does not aim to do that. In fact, it aims to provide critical information so that people who would like to do marketing can use the facts and the data presented to design those plans themselves. In addition, market studies are about markets. Markets are not people. They do not solve people problems. So if you approach this study looking for spiritual guidance, for evidence of your lifestyle being the right lifestyle, for an approach to trying to find how you fit in the world, where your company should go, etc., you will be disappointed because philosophically, this study looks at the market only. It is focused on facts, data, and critical information that can support decision-making about the market. Ultimately, that can only be done by people. And so we hope that people will deeply engage with these facts and this data in order to bring it to life. And then finally, following on what, on what Chad said, a market study is a snapshot in time. It is not something that can live and breathe. It can be updated, but it necessarily includes some information and does not include others. It necessarily is bounded within a time frame and will change over time. So if you have questions about what decisions were made, who was interviewed and why, what was cited and why, these are all important, but necessarily bounded by the constraints of the study itself. We feel extremely proud of the work that has been done. We think that it stands on its own and that it speaks for itself. And we hope that you will deeply and rigorously engage with the information that is presented there and bring it to life yourselves. All right, I'd like to turn this over to my colleague, uh, Marga, or, sorry, Mariana de la Rosa, who is going to join us by answering the question, what is a market study for? What does it cover and who is it for? Mariana, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Carla, USDA, ISC team, and all of our colleagues out there who are behind the screen and kindly join this, um, this launch that is extremely excited for us. Um, so basically, uh, who is it for? Like Anya said at the beginning, it is for this market study is meant to be for everybody, for producers, producers, organizations, for processors, for exporters, for government organizations, for donors, and in for everybody involved in the cocoa value chain. What we hope is to provide a better understanding of the sector dynamics, uh, more adequate prioritization of actions and interventions. So in a nutshell, it is for all of us involved in the chain. Um, what does it cover? I think Chad made a great overview, but it's basically the, an overview of the industry, global dynamics, market trends, supply and demand, um, information on prices, this is an exciting chapter, information on sustainability, legal requirements, competitor analysis, and it's filled with information. And what we brought today is a glimpse of what can you out there as a reader expect in each of the chapters that we have um, right in this uh, six month period of research. And now we turn it over to our colleague, uh, Marika Van Sanport. And please, Marika, go ahead and take us through who Gaia Cacao is and what the study is. Okay, thank you, Carla. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so Gaia Cacao is, um, is a company uh, based in Amsterdam, and we are specialized in cacao and cacao uh, products. I see Marianne, you're sharing. Okay. Um, yes, here we are. So Gai Cacao is a company based in Amsterdam, specialized in cacao and cacao products, derivatives. Um, we founded the company in 2019. Uh, myself, uh, Marika, and Mariana de la Rosa are the founders. 
Um, and the aim of our business is to grow the market for good uh, cacao. And we do this in all kinds of projects, uh, research projects such as this one. Um, and we work together with governments, private companies, NGOs, and, and more. Um, at the beginning of this year, we were uh, excited to see that this uh, project, the tender project was set out and we decided to apply for it. Uh, we're super proud that, to have been selected uh, to be the partners to conduct this very condensed, rich uh, research project. Um, we've been working together in a group of consultants. We were five uh, core team members and I'm going to introduce everybody later on as well. Um, and we're working with a group uh, of other people who have supported us throughout these past six months. Um, yeah, maybe the agenda, we can go on back first. Yes, so Gaia Kakao, that's uh, already been mentioned. I'm going to take you through the project team who've been working on this, and then we're going to start talking about the Global Cocoa Market Study. And we're not going to go in depth on every little thing because it's just too much, but we're just going to highlight a couple of things that you can find per chapter um, in, in the report. So we're going to talk about the purpose, the methodology, and the content per chapter. And then we go over to the Dominican Republic case study. Um, we're the same thing. We'll go into the purpose and we'll go into the content uh, and all the exciting things that you can find per chapter. And then in the end, there's a bit of time for questions. Okay, so yeah, we uh, have been working together with, uh, with several researchers and I'm going to introduce the core team, which we call the Gaia Netherlands team or the GNT. Um, Mariana de la Rosa, my, my colleague, my partner, co-founder of Gaia Cacao, she was um, the team leader of this project. Um, she has uh, more than 12 years experience working in cocoa uh, and chocolate, and she has actually started her career working for Nestle. Um, her role as a project leader was to really communicate about, uh, yeah, to all the stakeholders involved about the, the, the activities that were taking place, the deadlines deliverables, so super important role in the project. Um, then myself, Marika van Sanford, co-founder also of Gaia Cacao. I have a background in human rights and I've been working in the cocoa sector for almost nine years, uh, mainly working as a consultant for the industry, training companies, supporting them with strategy and setting up projects. Uh, my role in this project was as an industry specialist and as a coordinator. Um, then there's Jeroen Kruft, is the founder of uh, Amigos International. It's a consultancy company. And he often, and the company often participates in studies on coffee and cocoa. So you will see his name often in CBI studies, for example. Um, his uh, extensive uh, research experience, market research experience, and his sustainability-minded sustainability approach really made him a excellent industry specialist in the project. Uh, we have Gustavo Ferro, who's not here live with us today, but he will be joining us nevertheless. He's an independent consultant, and his name also often comes up when you type in Coco, and especially when you're on the CBI uh, website, because he's a uh, lead uh, researcher on the coffee and the Coco um, projects for CBI. And his market intelligence skills and his strategy thinking uh, really made him the best marketing specialist that we could wish for. And um, him and Mariana traveled to the Dominican Republic to do research there a couple of months ago. Kati, Kati Sanchez Amiquero, is a PhD candidate at Wageningen University. And the Wageningen University is one of the leading food universities in the world. Um, she was researching on uh, Peruvian cocoa value chains and has a lot of experience in quantitative and quantitative research and data analysis, which really helped us as she was our statistical validator in the project. Then last of this group here is uh, Dr. Hilda Toby. Um, she is a renowned researcher and a lecturer at the University of Wageningen. Uh, she wrote more than 100 uh, papers and articles on methodology. So she was the right person to guide us through a very robust methodology and statistical approach. Then we also have an extended team that are also very important uh, to, to us. Um, the first one, Omar Carabayo, who uh, is from the Dominican Republic, and he was the country lead for the study that we did in the, in the DR. Um, he supported us with all kinds of um, uh, logistics, setting up interviews and joining us for interviews. So um, 
thank you to Omar. Then there's Anna, Anna Tavares, who also is from the DR, and she helped us also uh, setting up interviews and logistics as well. And Jose Antonio Lara is a data analyst uh, working for Gaia Cacao, and he played an important role to uh, help us understand all the data coming back and also translating this into beautiful graphs that you will see in the report. Um, Luisa Ticona and Maricielo Tokunaga, both are from Peru. Both have been a great help to our project. Uh, they helped us with data collection and supporting us during the many interviews that we did. And then we have Amable Espina, who works for Gaia Cacao, supporting us on project management activities throughout um, the project. Thank you. Now, just uh, going deep into the global cocoa market study, here is a report and uh, basically where we centralize existing studies, knowledge and data. Um, some of you in the audience out there will see familiar graphs and expert quotes that you will read throughout. Um, we have triangulated all the information that we've gathered in order to be able to build this global cocoa market study. Now, in terms of the methodology we use, um, for this study, we had in place an extensive literature review where we analyzed uh, over 430 papers, articles, and publications. Uh, the second tool we use, we had in place was a semi-structured interviews. Um, we managed to run 62 uh, semi-structured interviews across all actors in the value chain for this research. Um, I know most of you are in the audience today, so I want to take the opportunity to thank you for contributing for this research. Now, for both tools, we design comprehensive spreadsheets so that we can um, gather all this relevant information from each document and from each interview so that it was captured and analyzed accordingly. Now, just going deep into the report, what you will find in the first chapter is we looked at the industry background and the historical overview. And uh, we did this through a timeline, you can see it here, where we highlighted the main historical events that shaped the cocoa sector. So political struggles, corporate decisions, sustainability initiative, you can also find on this uh, graph. In this chapter, we also, you will also come across industry definitions, so such as product types or the different segments that we have established in the cocoa sector based on the literature we had as a base. In the second chapter, which is about global market trends and requirements, aims to provide an overview of the evolution of the cocoa supply and demand at global, regional, and local level. So this chapter provides a very rich quantitative information on how the global, regional, and local supply of cocoa beans and derivatives have evolved in the last decades. The first figure on the upper left shows the evolution of the global cocoa production by region in the last 58 years, where the Africa region shows an important growth in the last decades. On the demand side, this chapter also provides information on the global demand by industry and product, which is about cocoa beans and derivatives. The second figure on the upper right shows the evolution of cocoa beans imports, both in volume and value. This chapter also provides a very rich analysis of the balance between supply and demand. The reader can find these uh, projected circles for 2020. The figure on the lower left side can be found in the study and shows the surplus and deficit of cocoa beans at global level. The market study also contains information on the demand by region. The figure on the lower right side shows these uh, regional cocoa grindings from 2003 till uh, 2020. This chapter also uh, explores how local markets are important in three countries, Brazil, Colombia, and Indonesia uh, were selected for this. And also we analyze how the trade flows between three producing countries and its neighbor countries can create possible synergies. The end of this chapter provides a very rich overview of the impact of COVID-19 on the cocoa industry. The global dynamics. Uh, the market study provides uh, a map for the global cocoa value chain, which is, uh, is this slide in the left, uh, in the left side. Is it, this is the result of the value chain mapping that we uh, developed 
core actors uh, for each stage of the global value chain were identified we also provide a very detailed description like estimated number of factors, examples of companies, their main role and activities and their requirements in terms of annual volume, frequency of orders, uh, which quality they require, certification, etc. And in the lower side of also uh, the market study contains this information, this table, uh, which is about the European and USA legal requirements for cocoa and cocoa products. The next chapter is about pricing. So <clears throat> there's a lot of factors involved in what drives the prices of uh, cacao. Um, supply and demand is uh, by far still the, the biggest factor, but what drives supply and demand? We, we look into that very deeply. Uh, we do an analysis of stock to grind ratios, but we also try to really, in layman's terms, uh, explain what hedging is and how it can be used and where to be careful. Uh, country differentials are important, uh, as you can see in graphs that are being used throughout the report, but also certification and, and quality may influence price uh, setting. Um, investments in the market, uh, looking at also managed money and even speculation, um, also drive some prices and, and to what extent we, we look into that uh, in, a, in a critical way and based on the research and our interviews we come to interesting conclusions. Uh, there's a lot of liquidity in the market that we look at is that important. Um, computerized trading is something of the last years. Tariffs, trade agreements, taxes are being discussed and also how crises could possibly affect prices. Now, if you look at the stock market, um, you know, the big question always is why this volatility? Why is, does it go up and down these prices? Uh, when we talk to farmers worldwide, it's always a big headache. And also, of course, for traders and manufacturers. So we look into the reasons behind that. We look at uh, elasticity. In fact, we uh, come to the conclusion that cocoa is not really all that uh, inelastic uh, or not that elastic. It's actually quite inelastic and especially also looking at the volatility. It's not that bad in comparison to other commodities. Anyways, there's a, there's a profound uh, analysis of that. And of course, this has everything to do with the future exchanges in New York and London. We, got, we get into that as well, try to explain it as best as we can. Farm gate prices then, how, do, how are farmers affected by, by the world uh, market prices? How are they affected by uh, their economy, which sometimes is regulated by their government, takes a huge chunk of tax, perhaps being reinvested, but uh, um, how it, does that compare to liberalized cocoa economies where usually the farm gate price is higher, but maybe the government is much less involved? How do uh, farming uh, farm gate prices compare uh, between conventional cacao and certified cacao or quality cacao? And how could you actually increase farm gate prices? We look at that as well, based on all of the literature available and our interviews that we did. Now, also looking at market concentration, this is an important part. And in fact, the Dutch Parliament once even um, asked for a, a separate study to be conducted, looking at why is there is market concentration really distorting things and does it drive poverty? And we also come to interesting conclusions related to that. Um, there is no time to get into that now, but I do want to mention that we also look yeah. at living income reference prices, and that is everything to do with how um, a living income, a, a good price could be um, attained for farmers. That in relationship to the living income differential, the LID, we look at that as well in great detail, the effects of that. Prices, structures, payment conditions, purchasing contracts. You need to know what is in a contract if you're in the cocoa industry. So you look at the CMAA, the FCC, but also ISO functions and their standards and what contracts look like. And finally, we look at how perhaps a product such as a chocolate bar is built up. Um, how is the cost distribution uh, being developed? And uh, there is a bunch of a body of literature on that as well. We pull all of that together and we try to analyze that and come to some conclusions on that as well. Yes, so um, this chapter that we wrote is about the trends that we have seen in the market. So during our many interviews that we did, uh, we asked the interviewees what they have seen, of course, what they've witnessed over the past years and what they foresee happening in the future. And based on these interviews, and we triangulated that with data that we saw uh, coming from, our, from the reports that we, we made, uh, we established um, several 
trends, big trends, and we explain them in this chapter. The first trend is on cocoa production um, reaching new records, sustainability becoming mainstream, expansion of multinationals, the be behavior of consumer that is changing, the health and wellness factor and how that drives structured consumption and the growth of the specialty market. Um, so these uh, trends are very well um, explained in this chapter and on each of the trend we also mention some key insights and at the, the last part of this chapter is describing which aspects are either growing the cocoa and chocolate sector or constraining it. In order to assess the key challenges that must be overcome in the cocoa industry and how to take advantage of business opportunities, this market uh, report contains a SWOT analysis, which is an analytical instrument used to identify significant internal and external elements within any business. So uh, we developed a SWOT analysis for conventional cocoa producers, both cocoa producers or organic cocoa producers and craft chocolate makers. The analysis of competition was done using uh, Michael Porter's five forces model, which is a very useful framework to assess the degree of competition in any industry. So we assessed these five forces that the model includes, and the result of this analysis is in the market study uh, for both uh, bulk cocoa beans and organic cocoa beans producers. We, great, we went to through, uh, we went to great length to also give a comprehensive overview of sustainability issues in the uh, cocoa sector. Uh, here we have to look at obviously definitions of say sustainability, but also how do you manage risks? Uh, who are the actors in the particular initiatives that are being um, uh, addressed right now that are being taken? And who in the end is responsible? Is it the consumer? Is it the trader? Is it the, uh, is it the farmers? Is it the multinationals? Uh, we look at that in, uh, in a critical way. Uh, we also look at living income. Uh, I mentioned already the LID, the uh, living income differential, which was, um, many of you will know what I'm talking about. We really analyze that and look at the consequences of that and um, cartel forming in general, if that could be policy that could uh, increase living income, or if you have to look at other ways, child labor, youth, gender, all of these issues are being uh, discussed and we're looking at various initiatives being taken worldwide, as well as ecological um, uh, aspects such as the deforestation. Um, granted, cocoa is not, uh, is, it only accounts for 2% of the agricultural deforestation, but still it's something worth to look at. Um, and uh, we do also look at agroforestry, um, the relation of yield and price versus deforestation. Um, also, uh, we look at various examples of deforestation, various uh, cocoa producing countries, and obviously the initiatives that are being taken by cocoa companies, FBOs, which are farmer-based organizations, but also by companies. So if we look at uh, ecological aspects, we cannot avoid the issue of climate change. To the right, you see the, the map um, uh, below is 2050, where you can see it's a uh, a little hotter then. So what are you going to do to mitigate that? What are the initiatives currently being taken by uh, the North and the South uh, in terms of climate change? Uh, but also we look at soil health. Uh, we look at uh, interesting uh, things that could mitigate um, climate change, but also increase uh, productivity um, and that could increase product uh, quality for at the farm level. Um, so we go into depth to there in incre um, including a discussion of uh, a new certification which goes beyond organic, which is called regenerative agricultural um, uh, certification. <clears throat> then we have uh, on sustainability also certification. Uh, for example, you can see to the left how much of the certified product is actually being sold with that certificate. You can see that there's still a big gap there, uh, but can that be avoided? Uh, how about government regulation on, on human rights? Uh, how about sustainability of companies? Uh, there are um, many initiatives being uh, launched currently by small but also large companies, but we look at them very critically, as you can see in this matrix that we've developed. Uh, we look at 10 major companies, and that's the next slide, please, uh, where we would have a, uh, 10 companies being, um, being measured against a variety of factors uh, KPIs that include sustainable 
sustainability aspects such as traceability, uh, child labor and uh, monitoring and remediation systems, or even child labor awareness or deforestation awareness, the income that you that is achieved or even goals that these companies will set. So we've tried to really look at that. This might need more work. Uh, that could be uh, some uh, a scope for next studies uh, by um, an, an organization to uh, uh, compare all these companies. In the end, we uh, do make some conclusions. Uh, we look at, uh, for example, price formation, where we feel, but we feel that perhaps there is limited influence of speculation and machine trading and price is still mostly supply and demand. Um, obviously, it's a very complex scheme, but read the report for that and you get all the nuances, hopefully. Uh, we look at uh, yield, um, we look at crop dependence. We feel that that may be driving poverty more than market concentration, perhaps, and that's going already a little bit toward the recommendations. Some farmers should move out of the sector, out of agriculture and move into other sectors when you have uh, too little land to um, cultivate um, your products on. We, we look at the multinationals, we look at sustainability, health and specialty segment driving the market. We also look at what drives sustainability. Could it be civil society, more and more taking companies and governments to court? Um, we also conclude that the, uh, Marika mentioned it already, we see sustainability being mainstreamed by larger companies. We see it more and more in supermarkets and with the major processors. And uh, in the end, we also have some conclusions on the importance of good policy. In the end, the recommendations um, are uh, many. They, are ish, uh, they deal with multiple issues that I mentioned before. Farmer income, where you could say perhaps declare force of limits. So you would have uh, limited land that would uh, create a better price. This is also supported by literature. Um, and it would, there would also have the win-win situation of uh, saving some of our last forests. We have uh, recommendations on human rights, deforestation, on youth, uh, on the empowerment of uh, producer country governments, where judicial processes are very important, and how to make sustainable intervention. And that would be the last point I'd like to make here. Uh, we feel that it's very important that donors have an exit strategy. Otherwise, uh, too many interventions that we've seen in the literature and also from, from our experience uh, don't uh, actually make a lasting impact if you don't know how to pull out in a sustainable way. Uh, I'll leave it at that and uh, back to the um, moderators. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Now, if you can imagine, the team from Gaia Cacao began this work in April and completed it in November, uh, meaning that they are more or less elite athletes at the end of a marathon wrapped in their silver heat retaining blankets. Um, we do need to congratulate them for completing this enormous amount of work in such a short period of time. Uh, most people were in strong agreement that this was an enormously ambitious project. And so we ask you as readers to keep that in mind as you read. In addition to the global cocoa market study, there is a Dominican Republic supply case study. You may wonder why it is that the Dominican Republic was the subject of this focus. That is because the exporting quality program funded by USDA and coordinated by IESC has been taking place. Um, it's just ended in the Dominican Republic after several years. And so this was in many ways a capstone project to conclude that work. Um, in order to show this particular part of the study, a video has been recorded that features our colleagues Mariana de la Rosa of Gaia Cacao and Gustavo Ferro, who was also part of the research team from Gaia. All right, Mariana, please go ahead. So the next report we would like to take you through and explain every chapter is about the Dominican Republic cocoa supply case study um, that comes with this project. So the methodology we had in place for this uh, Dominican Republic case study included an extensive literature review. And since this study was conducted in parallel to the global market study, uh, we had the same data collected. So the 430 papers, articles, and publications were also analyzed and contextualized for this uh, report. Um, the next tool we used was related to the in-depth semi-structured interviews. Again, we took the global ones to incorporate into the study and we included 39 interviews where most of them were conducted during our field trip in the Dominican Republic. 
Um, we also had uh, the opportunity to conduct three focus groups. Um, each of them had different uh, topics related to the objectives of the project. And we included in these focus groups um, uh, members of the management of cooperatives, uh, government organizations, uh, technicians and uh, field and extension cocoa technicians, processing companies, exporters, etc. cetera. Uh, we also had the luxury to have during our field trip to organize a producer, producer sector round table in Ato Mayor, one of cocoa producing regions in Dominican Republic, just to gather insights uh, from, from the producers. And the last uh, data collection tool we used uh, for this uh, project was uh, the producer survey. And uh, this was possible for the cooperation and our local and the support of our local team. Um, so the so survey was conducted in all of the cocoa regions in the Dominican Republic, in uh, the relevant municipalities, and we uh, so this survey yielded 172 producers. Uh, an important another element that we would like to highlight that it, it's it's in this report we call that the voice of the producer is actual qualitative data that came from the survey and that we incorporated into different chapters as you read along. It was actually a suggestion from one of our advisors, uh, Almanda Berlan, to put this uh, softer touch to the report. Uh, now going into the actual content of the report, uh, we started with the uh, Dominican Republic's position in the cocoa industry. Uh, and we did this through a timeline where we highlighted the main historical events that impacted and shaped the cocoa sector. And also we provided uh, here in this chapter an analysis of the impact level and the implications to the actual current profile of the sector in the country. Uh, we included, of course, events such as when uh, Cocoa was introduced in the, into the country, uh, different export development uh, policies, natural disasters, also uh, development plans and other um, uh, elements to this timeline. And also important to highlight here is that uh, this chapter brings key terms, industry standards, and common definitions to contextualize the case study. And maybe an interesting thing that compared to the global study is uh, we took some of the industry standards, which are very specific and key terms that are very specific to the Dominican Republic. Uh, secondly, so in the second chapter, we have the Dominican Republic's scope to supply analysis. And we did this analysis and a perspective on the evolution and the current position of Dominican Republic uh, in relation to the global cocoa industry. So uh, every time we talk about the local context, we always take it to a higher level and compare it with other supply countries, but also uh, to the market position in different international markets. So we're looking into the evolution of the production, the harvested area and yield, the exports per product category, including conventional certified, but also the Sanchez and the Española. Uh, the main destinations for uh, Dominican Republic's exports, both in terms of beans, but also all possible derivatives and finished products that are uh, coming from cocoa. And one important aspect, of course, is certification, uh, production and sales of certified cocoa, uh, the different certifications that are available, uh, organic, fair trade, rainforest alliance, and of course, comparing uh, average prices uh, with other producing countries as well and the fine flavor status and the exports from the Dominican Republic, also in relation to global suppliers. Uh, in the third chapter, we look into the value chain. So uh, it's interesting that uh, what Mariana mentioned about the methodology, uh, very powerful methodologies we used uh, and we could really optimize the results here were inputs from interviews and focus group discussions. We actually mapped out the value chain together with sector stakeholders locally. Uh, which allowed us to look into the value chain dynamics and also the interactions amongst the stakeholders. And in this chapter, we describe the uh, each core actor in the Dominican cocoa value chain, uh, both yeah the local actors, but also their relation to international market actors. Uh, one very special typology here that you describe is the cocoa producers. Uh, this typology, of course, was only possible to be described so much in depth due to and thanks to the survey that we conducted among all these producers uh, in the in the target group in the sample that were uh, that was used 
and uh, different uh, categories, different groups were defined by this uh, survey and were possible to be described in this chapter. Uh, the next chapter we have in the report is about productivity. Now we, underst we understand that different factors can have an influence on the productivity. So we took the opportunity uh, of the survey to make interesting correlations. So uh, we started making links based on also literature review, interviews, focus groups uh, that we could take note, adapt and um, study. So for instance, things you will find on this chapter is uh, the productivity versus the size of the producer versus the access to credit, uh, technical assistance, um, level of education, associativity, for instance, so we would understand whether a farmer who we, or producers who is uh, associated to a farmer-based organization will have more or less productivity and all this you can, um, you can find more details on the chapter. Uh, the next one is about the, the value provided by each of the marketing channels. Now, uh, what Gustavo just mentioned earlier, now that we have defined the, the value chain or the core of the value chain, we want to understand the value of each of the products as it goes through that chain. Um, so the basis we had for this um, analysis was, um, well, understanding the value of the cocoa beans per US metric tons for each of the product segment in relation to the world market prices. So then we also had the value um, in uh, US dollars per ton per cocoa derivative. We also understood the producer cost to enable this profit margin analysis. And this we based it on the literature, but also we had a, a focus group activity where we could, we could yeah, get the produ producer cost based on the experts on the room to give us a better uh, enlighten us to this uh, actual costs. Um, and the other key piece of information is the FOB prices of the cocoa butter um, based on the data from the Commission, Commission Nacional de Cacao in the Dominican Republic. Um, then now that we have set up the basis to do the price structure and the profit margin analysis, um, one of the things we noticed during the filter is that producers in the Dominican Republic have, you know, have they select the marketing channel depending on the specific needs. And all these needs we capture in the survey, but we also are reflected in, and analyzed in the report. So basically a producer can sell to an intermediary, to an association, to a cooperative, or directly to an exporter. And based on all these possible marketing channels is where, how we estimated the price structure and profit margin. So we had two different scenarios, as you can see there, for example, marketing uh, channel A involved four actors. So a producer selling to an intermediary, to a farmer-based organization exporter, and then the, the foreign manufacturer. And then you have a shorter chain where a cocoa producer will sell to an exporter and then to the foreign uh, manufacturer. Several considerations and assumptions were made for each of these calculations. And what you will see in the report is that um, table on the side where you have um, per channel, per marketing channel selected the different um, profit margins. And most of these assumptions we use to make all of this calculation, it's basically based in um, interviews, focus groups, and the data gathered from the survey. Yeah, an important to mention here is the richness of data that we could get from the National Cocoa Commission. So uh, it's important when conducting such uh, studies that uh, such data are also available for uh, this kind of analysis. Indeed, it's a luxury, the data that the Commission had gathered. Yeah. Uh, the next chapter is about uh, um, agroforestry systems. Uh, what we see in this, what we will see in this chapter is uh, agroforestry benefits the alternative crops and the farmer's income. And we also look at income diversification activity. Um, we also understood the different alternative crops that were mentioned during the survey. And one uh, key element that I want to um, um, make a few remarks is or uh, highlight is the demonstrative plots. So experts in the Dominican Republic, while we were, they were being interviewed, mentioned that the choice of the crops and the species will depend on the geographic location. So although the Dominican Republic is a small country, there are marked climatic regions throughout the territory that are important to consider. And um, the results of, <clears throat> of this study are not yet conclusive, 
but uh, it is for all of the actors who are joining this webinar today to keep an eye on these results and you know benefit from the from the science behind this um, this analysis. Next chapter is about uh, sustainability, uh, using as a basis what my colleague Jerun explained earlier from the global. Uh, now we contextualize to the Dominican Republic. So the elements that you will find on this chapter cover our uh, climate change resilience, um, uh, gender, the living income. In fact, that uh, photo you see there on the slide related to the uh, living income uh, reference price, which is taken from Carla Wildhausen. We did that calculation for the Dominican Republic. So looking forward to hear your feedback. Um, and the other photo there refers to the agroclimatic regions um, spotted in the, in, the, in the country and how to implement these different, um, uh, the actions that should be implemented to these regions, to these different regions. Now looking into the market opportunities for Dominican Republic, this already is a more conclusive chapter. We take different lessons from the statistics and also from the market opportunities that have been identified throughout also the global study. Uh, we do an analysis of the opportunities for Dominican Republic in terms of the expansion to high value markets for cocoa beans, but also looking into derivatives, the potential growth in different product segments, but also different market segments internationally. And for that, of course, we use the st statistics provided, but also qualitative analysis based on the global study, but also our knowledge of market developments. Uh, yeah, we use some tools such as the ITC export potential tool to uh, make this analysis a little bit easier, a little bit more um, procedural as well. Uh, another important point that we discuss here is the integration of the new cocoa producing regions within Dominican Republic. Uh, meaning how to integrate these producers into the mainstream channels for the Dominican Republic local industry. And of course, a very interesting uh, discussion around ecotourism and agrotourism as an experience that can be integrated into the cocoa industry as well. In fact, as we were leaving um, the country, we were just uh, witnessed the opening of the visitor center of uh, Herma, Corte Hermano, which is an important um, Good. Um, cocoa manufacturing in the Dominican Republic. So we do see already the country moving towards this, um, this opportunity. And now to finalize the recommendations and potential uh, investments that we have identified, you can see an example here of how we have uh, described this chapter. You see that the voice of the producer is also uh, appearing in this chapter, meaning that throughout the study, we try to integrate the voice of the producer as well. Some areas of recommendations and potential interventions that we have described are also highlighted here in terms of productivity, uh, cultivation systems and crop diversification, local value addition and marketing, which uh, Mariana mentioned previously also is part of this local market development and integration into tourism, for example. And uh, the consciousness, the awareness of the local population towards higher value products, for example, uh, climate change resilience, the development of human resources that actually allow for the uh, advancement of the industry, the cacao as an industry, uh, associativity to strengthen the sector. We know that Dominican Republic has high associativity, but we also have described uh, potential investments to enhance associativity. Uh, youth participation in uh, agricultural programs, including in the cocoa sector, and also uh, an approach towards a specialty segment. And uh, last but not least, uh, how to handle inf information. And in this case, we have described how to keep an up-to-date agricultural census that will allow to have information uh, for yeah, very exact interventions in the future in the sector. Yeah, and uh, just uh, just as uh, Gustavo said before, one of the things we 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 noticed by taking the opportunity to take to to observe during our field trip is the the need of uh, the human resources, so highly skilled um, individuals in the cocoa industry to further develop it. And um, last thing we wanted to share with all of you in the audience today is that uh, based on this study, uh, we build up a country template which has the specific objective to serve as a guidance and that captures everything we did to, to conduct this research. So it has two parts, one that is related to the process um, and the other one is related specifically to the content using as a basis the global cocoa market study we, we also did. 
Uh, so we do, we provide, for example, a detailed description on how to carry out this, um, this research in a cocoa specific region or a cocoa specific country. It includes tools, tips um, for it to develop each of the chapters. So uh, all where to find relevant information, what data collections tools come in handy to answer uh, each of these research questions, et cetera, you can find in this um, country template, which will be made also available by the team of IESC. Uh, I think I'll now hand over to my colleague to finish up this um, this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to Mariana and to Gustavo for that. Um, for those of you who are following along, I hope it's clear how intensely detailed this work is. And as a professor, I would be remiss in my work if I did not suggest that good writing benefits from good readers. So what I can recommend as part of the team that has read many drafts of this study and worked with it for a period of months, what we uh, strongly suggest so as to avoid feeling overwhelmed by the details or you know, intimidated by the level of rigor that has been applied here, that you spend time getting to know the table of contents of each study, examining the methodology, and then determining within each study what section would be of the biggest benefit to the questions that you seek to answer. The real challenge that exists with something like this is that this is an enormous amount of information that has been very thoughtfully and carefully crafted and presented. It therefore needs readers that will engage with it at the same level. And that means taking the time to get to know the documents and to seek out different questions that you might have answers to. The studies themselves will not be able always to exactly answer your questions, but they will be able to provide you with accurate data and with facts carefully considered that can provide you with the critical information that you need to make decisions. And our hope that this is that these studies will be used by individuals, by organizations, and we could even potentially think about using them in society at large as a way to address many of the issues that we see in the cocoa and chocolate value chain. Some important things to underline as we conclude are that market studies themselves remain about markets. So the types of questions that you can ask of this must be linked with cocoa and chocolate markets, and they must also therefore inform your answers in cocoa and chocolate markets. But of course, these markets never exist in a vacuum. And one of the things that repeatedly comes up throughout the studies is that the very serious social issues that come about in cocoa and chocolate markets are in fact not exclusive to cocoa or to chocolate. They would require much broader societal solutions in order to address. So our hope is that as you study the market, you will also be thinking about the way in which the, the, these studies can be used to try and answer some of those larger social questions and how people themselves can be a part of those solutions. And the final thing that I'd like to say is that again, these studies were conducted in extraordinary circumstances. A pandemic that is continuing has been part of the entire process of doing this and has impacted in every way what has been possible. So this has required a lot of ingenuity and creativity on the part of all of the people involved in order to ensure that health and safety were protected as the studies were completed and to address some of the very serious challenge related to travel bans, lack of, lack of vaccination, and more that delimited what was possible to do in conducting these studies. They've also been done as globally people ex are experiencing serious levels of exhaustion, of frustration, and of difficulty related to this pandemic. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that they've been done in conditions that are not okay and have managed to still approach a very serious level of sophistication and detail. Our hope is that you as an audience for these studies will share them 
We'll use them to educate, to make informed decisions, to communicate with one another. In other words, to basically improve the way in which we talk about cocoa and chocolate supply chains. We hope that you will continue to ask questions. You'll see that we've put into the chat where further questions can be sent and addressed. And a best case scenario would be if you took this information and you brought it to life in your own work. We very much hope that that will be the case. We're enormously grateful to USDA, to IESC, and to Gaia Cacao for making all of this possible. And we invite you to be part of an ongoing conversation in bringing these studies to life. Thank you all for your time and your attention. The recording of this webinar will be available shortly after for those who you might like to share it with. And we encourage you to download these free open access studies and use them. Put them on your desks and make them part of your everyday engagement with this supply chain. Thank you, everyone. Stay healthy and take good care and stay tuned for more. Thank you, everybody. Thank you and bravo to all. Thank you.